It's okay. Um, thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, as I'm a year gynecologist, so I'm really passionate about pelvic floor disorders. Um, the two most common type of pelvic floor disorders that I'm going to talk about today um, are the following urinary incontinence and prolapse. I kind of want to touch a little bit on prolapse. I know this is just um, a talk for urinary incontinence, but I added three or four slides about prolapse uh, for some individuals who may have also um, prolapse disorder. So I don't know, I can progress my screen. Yes, so um, just to give you uh, some a little bit of background where we see patients, we see patients with pelvic floor disorder in the six locations at Henry Ford. And we have like 800 number to call if you wish um, to see uh, one of us. Um, it's me, Dr. Estenal, and Dr. Luck, who is currently seeing patients for um, pelvic floor disorders, urinary incontinence or prolapse or fecal incontinence. So um, we are gonna talk about um, some kind of introduction for pelvic floor disorder, risk factors, um, some that you can control and some that you cannot control, urinary incontinence and prolapse, anatomy basics, symptoms, the types, diagnosis and treatment, and there will be question and answer um, down the road. So there is a pop quiz. As a woman, um, your chance of getting a pelvic floor disorder is one in three, one in six, or one in nine. Any one who wants to chime in? B. B, one in six. So it's one in three. So it's more common than one in, one in six, but one, in, one to three to six is okay. Um, about one in three women will experience pelvic floor disorder in her lifetime. So it's a pretty common condition. Uh, as long as you're a woman, you're at risk to have this problem down the road. So what is pelvic floor? Pelvic floor are a set of muscles and ligaments and connective tissue in the lowest part of our body. And this is where the pelvic floor, this entire area here that holds the bladder, the vagina and the rectum in place are the pelvic floor muscles, ligaments and connective tissues. They support the bladder, uterus, rectum and vagina to keep them up and help control the pelvic organ functioning, three most common three functions, voiding, bowel movement, and vaginal intercourse, and childbirth. So um, problems with bladder or bowel are caused by weakness of the pelvic floor muscles or connective tissue that support our pelvic floor. One or more symptoms could be feelings pressure or bulge coming out of the vagina, urinary incontinence or urine leakage, overactive bladder, like I gotta go, I gotta go right now. Uh, we call it urgency. The urinate difficulty in emptying our bladder, problems having bowel movement, difficulty in emptying um, gas or stool leakage, um, accidental bowel incontinence, also known as fecal incontinence. There are three types of pelvic floor disorder. Number one, the most common is the bladder control problem, uh, which is urinary incontinence or accidental urine leak. It happens in about 16 to 20% of women. The pelvic organ prolapse is the least common, happens in about 3 to 11% of women. And the bowel control problems, is, which is accidental bowel leakage, fecal incontinence, and anal incontinence in about 9% of women. Which of the following are risk factors for pelvic floor disorders? Pregnancy, aging, overweight, and smoking. Well, or all of the above. So the answer will be all of the above. Um, if you're gonna look at it that way, we have some things that we can control, lifestyle modifications, such as not smoking, maintaining normal body weight, being physically active, 
being more cautious in doing um, your exercises, avoiding extreme sports or extreme heavy weight lifting, limiting your caffeine or excessive fluid intake and avoiding constipation. Maintaining good health, such as keeping pelvic floor healthy, um, controlling your blood sugar can also help uh, for us women to, develop, to not to develop pelvic floor disorder where there is some less controllable um, risk, lifestyle, life stages. And then as we get older, of course, um, this particular disorder gets to get more common as we get, this, or, uh, as we get older. Pregnancy and childbirth is one of the common reasons why we would have this pelvic floor disorder. Um, this is one of the inciting events that will lead us to develop pelvic floor disorder and then later on in life would manifest as urinary incontinence. There are certain health conditions such as pelvic injury, pelvic surgery such as hysterectomy increases the risk for pelvic floor disorder, urinary incontinence, and prolapse. Um, chronic lung disease. If you have COPD, like you have bronchitis, you have emphysema, that makes you cough a lot of times and that weakens your pelvic floor. Neurological problems such as dementia, Parkinson's, um, multiple sclerosis, um, stroke, all those can contribute to um, not actually weakness, but also could contribute for us to develop um, urinary problems down the road, such as urinary incontinence, um, overactive bladder. So in the United States, 8 million of women will have urinary incontinence. Do not wait to talk to your doctor. Um, in fact, 26% in a study done by uh, Dr. Norton, 26% of women will wait for over five years to seek help. 33% will wait one to five years, and 41% will seek help within one year. So anatomy basics, we, uh, we all know urethra and vagina are two separate openings. This is our urethra right here. This is our vagina, and this is, our direct, this is the rectal opening or the anal opening down here. Um, and then, how does it work? How does the bladder work? Um, your body will store urine in the bladder. The bladder will connect to, a, this is your, your bladder here and this is the urethra here. And the bladder will connect to a tube called urethra and the muscles and nerves will help to control the bladder and the urethra. These are the pelvic floor muscles here. We do have central control and that comes from brain and spinal cord, such that some patients who would have um, stroke, spinal cord injury, um, multiple sclerosis, um, and Parkinson's and dementia could still present with urinary incontinence because that would come from the central nervous system. So when you go, these muscles here at our pelvic floor will signal urine that our urine is ready to leave our body. It will signal something in our brain, it's ready to leave. And what our brain will do will signal back to our bladder and tells our bladder, your bladder is ready to go. I will relax your urethra and I will make your bladder contract and then you will empty that way. So that's how our bladder works. So another pop quiz. Bladder control problems only occur in women after menopause. This is false, no. Um, anyone can have this problem and even men can have bladder control problems. So all ages of women can be affected. Urinary incontinence is more common in older women and up to 38% of those um, age 80 years old and over would have urinary incontinence but one in four younger women aged 20 to 39 years old could also have urinary incontinence. And this is second, could be secondary from pregnancy, um, gaining weight because the weight can press on our pelvic floor and cause incontinence. As I've said earlier, bodybuilding and intensive weight training 
could be a risk for both urinary and bowel incontinence. So what are the symptoms of control problems? And this control problems actually start with problems with the muscles and the nerves that, that help to control or hold the urine before it comes out. Um, so urinary incontinence is equal to loss of urine. So other symptoms will, of urinary incontinence is strong sudden urge to go to the bathroom, which we call urgency. Um, and sometimes you cannot hold it. And so it results to involuntary loss of both small and large amount of urine with activities. It could be with coughing, laughing, and straining, or it could be with nothing, that you just would lose it, sudden urge, and you would just lose it before you get to the restroom. Um, there are certain individuals that can present with slow or interrupted urine stream or sense of incomplete bladder emptying. And um, there, it can lead to some sexual problems because sometimes urine leakage can even happen during sexual activity. And also, um, if it continues to happen on younger women who are sexually active, it can become a negative or de deterrent for them to continue to be sexually active because of shame and uh, embarrassment of having leakage. Three types of urinary incontinence, most common stress incontinence. This is the leakage when you're coughing or sneezing. This is the leakage that is secondary to weakness of the pelvic floor muscles. The second most common type of incontinence is urgency incontinence. And most commonly, it's called overactive bladder. This is a gotta go, gotta go right now, I need to go. And gotta go right now, I cannot hold it, and it becomes an incontinence. Or gotta go more frequent, which is frequency. And also one of them, one of the symptoms could also be going too frequent at night and making you wake up with severe urgency and not making it to the bathroom. This is the overactive bladder. And then the other type is mixture of the both. Then it becomes more difficult because you have both incontinence. Uh, unfortunately, as we get older, 50% of women present to my practice with mixed urinary incontinence, both urge and stress incontinence. And there are certain individuals who would just present with unpredictable continuous leakage that happens every time. So another question, making changes to your diet may help control the urinary incontinence. It is somewhat true. Making changes to your diet can help you control your urinary incontinence. This may have something to do with the overactive bladder because overactive bladder is a bladder that goes into spasm and makes you wanna go urgently and, and immediately. So if you're having that symptoms, avoiding something that irritates your bladder, such as coffee, pop, or tea, may help control the urinary incontinence. So what are the urine treatments for the urinary incontinence? Um, it depends on what treatment is best for you. You can always ask your doctors about the risk, potential complication, and follow-up care uh, when receiving treatment for urinary incontinence. Most commonly, we start, we start with lifestyle changes, bladder diary, meaning monitoring your urine uh, every time that you go to the bathroom and empty your bladder, monitoring your symptoms. And there is this Kegel exercises or pelvic muscle exercises. Um, additional options for urinary incontinence, uh, but in particular with stress incontinence will be a uh, passery, pelvic floor physical therapy, bulking agents, and surgery. We'll talk about more uh, these options here um, in my next slides. Urgency incontinence, physical therapy, medication, and surgery. And a combination, and a treatments may be needed when you have both stress and urgency incontinence. So what are the lifestyle changes? If you're overweight, it is, oh, it is advised that you lose weight. There are certain studies that have shown that losing at least five to 10% of your body weight 
would have significant impact to your urinary incontinence. So I always encourage that to my patients. Limiting alcohol and caffeine. As I mentioned, these are bladder irritants. Caffeine is one of the biggest bladder irritants that I ask the patient to start considering quitting. If you are big on caffeine, it stays on your body for six to eight hours. If you drink coffee, 6 p.m., six to eight hours later, you're still going to go to the bathroom urgently and frequently. So also avoid excess fluid or water intake. Ask the provider how much fluid you, you should be drinking. Uh, drinking too much is not good for you if you already have a problem. So this is a bladder diary that I'm talking about, making sure that you're tracking down how often that you're, you're going to the bathroom. Um, try to time your schedule, like making sure that you're emptying your bladder um, every couple of hours or three hours so that you don't wait until your bladder is really full, that you need to go to the bathroom and you cannot hold it. I'm not going to go through this pelvic floor exercises unless you guys want to listen to a video. <laughs> Let me see. So I don't, I'm not sure if you can get the the volume though. If if not, just tell me to stop. Hi, my name is Leah and I'm a nurse practitioner. I'm going to talk today about how to do Kegel exercises. These exercises were named after Dr. Arnold Kegel who developed them. Kegel exercises can help to reduce urine leakage, especially the type of leakage that happens when you laugh or cough or sneeze or lift. You can also use these exercises if you have a sudden urge to go. Kegel exercises work to strengthen muscles around the vagina, rectum, and urethra. These muscles can become weakened over time due to pregnancy, childbirth, and aging. To find the correct muscle, insert one finger into the vagina and squeeze the muscles around your finger. As you squeeze, you should feel pressure around your finger and you should feel the anus uh, contract inward and upward. Be sure you don't squeeze your stomach, leg, or buttock muscles, and be sure not to hold your breath. Once you've found the right muscles, you no longer need to insert your finger into the vagina. I don't recommend doing these exercises while urinating to stop the flow. There's two types of Kegel exercises, quick and slow. Slow are considered the usual exercises, while quick flicks can quiet that sudden urge to go. To do a quick Kegel, squeeze and release the muscles as quickly as possible. Be sure that you let your pelvic muscles drop completely after each series of contractions. This exercise can help you with that immediate gotta go right now feeling. To do a slow Kegel, tighten the muscles, hold it for a count of three, and then release for a count of three. Work up to holding for a count of five and then a count of 10. Again, be sure to let your pelvic muscles drop completely after each series. You can do Kegel exercises anytime and anywhere. Try to associate an activity with your exercise, like uh, brushing your teeth or watching a TV commercial. I usually recommend doing between four to six sets of 10 Kegel exercises every day. As with any exercise, you have to be patient. You should begin to notice some improvement after four to six weeks. You should use the exercises at times when you're most likely to leak, such as while coughing or lifting. To keep the muscles strong, you'll need to continue doing the exercises on a regular basis over time. If your urine leakage does not improve, or certainly if it worsens, stop doing the exercises and contact your doctor or nurse. You could also consider working with a specially trained pelvic floor physical therapist to help with the Kegel exercises. I hope this has been helpful. So um, the pelvic floor, this is the, um, the pelvic floor voices of pelvic floor disorder is um, the website that I recommend that if you're seeking more information about pelvic floor disorders, this is a legitimate website uh, that you can get legitimate information from your gynecologist all over the United States and around the world. So uh, we're gonna move on to treatments, um, overactive bladder. So again, 
this overactive bladder is a gotta go, gotta go right now. Um, and you can retrain your bladder. Uh, we learn ways to control when you go, exercise your pelvic floor muscle, and make dietary changes to make this better. Physical therapy. Um, I'm a big advocate of pelvic floor physical therapy because not many of us women really truly know how to do the pelvic floor exercises. And just like what she said, uh, we were taught that stopping and going to urinate is one way to do the pelvic floor exercises. It is not a good way to do your pelvic floor exercises. And if you are trying to do a conservative approach for this problem and trying to do the Kegel exercises and you're not truly, you truly do not know how to do it and no one is monitoring your progress, you're not gonna make any progress. You'll just be very disappointed, um, frustrated that you're doing the Kegel exercises 10 times, six times a day, and it's still not working for you. With pelvic floor physical therapy, they'll give you um, some modalities. If you cannot get it, they'll give you biofeedback. Um, they'll give you um, electrodes to monitor your muscle strength. So there are certain medicines available that can relax your bladder. Um, we may need to like modify the dosage and try different medication until we find the right regimen for you. Uh, so just be patient, medication can work. Medication work in about 50 to 70%. Um, it's not gonna truly make it go away, but it can improve your symptoms. So these are treatments. If medication do not work, we try medication, it's not working. The side effects is very intolerable for you, unacceptable. There are certain options. So do not give up. Do not just say that I'm just gonna live my life with urinary incontinence. No, you don't have to live your life with urinary incontinence because there are other options such as Botox injection in the bladder. So Botox can be injected in the bladder. Um, this is an injection every six to nine months it can be done in the office or it can be done in the, in, in the uh, or under sedation anesthesia. Um, and then there is this pelvic um, or peripheral tibial nerve stimulation. The peripheral tibial nerve stimulation, I can't find my, my cursor so I can't point to you, but um, the peripheral tibial stimulation is the one with, um, with a device and a small needle. That is a small needle that is like an acupuncture needle and goes near like um, above the, the bone in our, in, a, in, our, in, in our foot. And it stimulates the nerve that goes to our bladder. It is um, a 30 minute session for 12 weeks um, and then maintenance every month. And then there is this nerve stimulator. We call it interstim. Um, that's the one, this is the interstim. Um, and it stimulates and modulates the nerve that goes to our bladder. So it gives us um, more control of the urination. And then there's also vaginal electrical stimulation. And then moving on for stress incontinence, stress incontinence is a different kind of incontinence. This is secondary to the weakness or of our pelvic floor. If exercises, lifestyle modification did not work for you, there's still some option. And this is what we call a passery. Passery is a rubber device. It's made up of high grade silicone rubber. It gets inserted vaginally. And if this is our urethra and this is our bladder, it will be inserted in the vagina and pressed on this area of our bladder here to provide control or liquid of leakage when you're coughing and sneezing. This exists in different shape and sizes, and it's size to fit the patient. Um, it supports the bladder and the urethra. And again, physical therapy is there for stress urinary incontinence. So if you're a person who have mixed urinary incontinence, both stress and both overactive bladder, then doing pelvic floor physical therapy could benefit both uh, of your problems. So um, surgical options, um, more invasive than just exercises and than just the passery. This is a bulking therapy. We're in an 
in material, the gel-like material, is injected around the urethra here. It creates those, um, those, those constriction in the urethra. It tightens the neck of the bladder to prevent urine leakage. This procedure is not permanent. Uh, it, it is typically repeated every one or two years. It is an outpatient procedure. It has a lower success rate than the other surgery uh, that I will describe later, which is this one. This one is uh, the bladder sling. This is what we call a sling. And this one here is made up of synthetic material. It gets inserted vaginally. You'll have a small incision in the vagina and this material gets inserted. Um, this sling will act as a hammock under the urethra. And it could be, like I said, mesh, which, which is made up of synthetic or material, or it could we could use your native tissue. We can harvest your own tissue to make it like a sling, or we can also use a cadaver tissue to make it as a sling. The purpose of this is to stop or reduce the leakage when you're coughing and sneezing, and the goal is to improve the quality of life. So this is like the hammock effect. This is, like, this is how the toned pelvic floor should look like. This is the droopy pelvic floor, such that it will make sense that you put that sling, it will help making your pelvic floor behave like this. So moving on to pelvic or organ prolapse, about half of women over 40 will have some form of pelvic organ prolapse. So what is pelvic organ prolapse? Um, we'll start with anatomy. This is again, secondary to pelvic floor muscles and ligaments that have weakened over time or stretch uh, and are too weak to hold the organs in the correct position in the pelvis. As it progresses, women will complain of bulge protruding through the opening of the vagina. So it could be a uh, dropping of the anterior vaginal wall or dropping with the bladder called cystocele. It could be a rectocele or dropping of the posterior vi vaginal wall with the rectum right here. And this is the bladder dropping right here. And the third will be the uterine, uterus dropping down. So uterus should be here. And when it's dropping, it drops down this way, downwards. So what are the symptoms? Pressure, heaviness in the pelvic area. You will actually see bulge coming out of the vagina and you're going to actually feel the bulge coming out of the vagina if you have this problem. And you can also have urinary problems with this. You can start to have difficulty in starting to urinate or kind of your urine comes out different direction when you try to empty your bladder. Um, you can have difficulty in having bowel movements because if the rectus seal is um, pinging uh, or impinging on the stool, so that it will be difficult for the stool to come out. Um, again, passery. Passery is still an um, acceptable option uh, for prolapse. Um, you have seen passery for stress incontinence earlier, and this one here is passery for the bulge. Um, life prolapse is not life threatening. So it is a quality of life issue. Um, if it doesn't bother you, most women will have a low grade prolapse that they may not need to do anything about it. But if it bothers you and starts to protrude out of the vagina, using this passery here can help you relieve your problems um, with the bulge. So these are different types or different kinds of passery. As you can see, there are so many of them. Um, this two here and this one here are the two most common types of passery I use in my practice. So what, and you can see how it works. Um, it pushes, the bladder pushes that rectum so that they are not sagging down. The same way with this passery here, it pushes its, this bladder and uterus up.
So every woman's situation is different. There's no single operation, single option that is right for every, for every, every patient. Um, depends on your body, your overall health. If you have prior surgery, desire to maintain sexual function and experience and training of the surgeon. The goal of the surgeon is to restore the normal anatomy and support and repair the vaginal wall and support the layer of the vaginal tissues to reduce the bulge and improve the quality of life. Um, the success or failure of someone operation should never be a deciding factor for you because everyone is different. Um, you and your doctor must decide on what is best for you. Um, another pop quiz is living with pelvic floor disorder a normal part of aging? No, it is not normal part of aging. We can do something about it. So be open to your doctor about your symptoms. Ask treatments, even your primary care doctors would know uh, how to, your primary doctor would know how to appropriately refer you when you have, when you tell them what your problems or concerns are. Do not wait until it's too long for you um, suffering about the urinary incontinence and bulge. Ask about seeing a specialist, request a referral if it's needed, and if you need a doctor, find a doctor that is a good fit for you. Both you and your both of you need to be comfortable discussing this very personal topic. Questions? That's it. 